This presentation was originally presented on the R SAS Witches Discord server. SAS stands for Skeptical, Agnostic or Atheist, and Science Seeking. It's a community where we talk about and study witchcraft, mainly with secular or psychological reasons and beliefs. It's one of my favorite communities to hang out in and learn and talk about tarot and divination in. So I was really excited to present what I know and share my knowledge, everything that I know and love about tarot. I presented this along with my friend, Justin, who I've also converted into a tarot nerd like me. I hope hearing our excitement about tarot gets you excited too. Enjoy! Welcome to our Tarot 101 presentation, the what, the why, and the how. We hope that we kind of come off like this teacher, but there's a chance we might end up being a little bit more like this teacher. Let us take a moment to introduce ourselves. So my name's Sarah. I've been doing tarot for two years. I needed something to do in the pandemic, right? My first deck was the Way of the Panda Tarot, which is this beautiful panda deck over here on the left. Other topics I can ramble on about include board games, crochet, and my tuxedo cat. Hi everyone, my name's Justin. I'm a reader of about one plus years. Uh, Sarah was actually the one who got me into tarot reading. A uh, fun fact about me, I once did readings for four hours straight one night. That was not a smart decision, but hey, what is life but a series of bad mistakes that you laugh at after the fact? <laughs> um, one thing I like to do is find video games that incorporate tarot cards. So if you know of, of any, uh, feel free to hit me up. And oh yeah, also that, that hoodie I'm wearing is probably the witchiest thing I own in my wardrobe. <laughs> All right, so we have an audience participation question here. Um, please answer this question in the chat. The question is, what is your experience or impressions of tarot? And or if another question could be, what burning questions do you have about tarot right now? Please type into the void, the chat. What's your experience or impressions of tarot so far? And or what burning questions do you have about tarot right now? What confuses you? What has stopped you from learning more about tarot so far? Justin, what was your first experience or impressions of tarot? And or what burning questions did you have about tarot when you first started? Well, my first, um, I guess my first impressions of it were, why is this person so insistent on reading on reading my future? And how the hell did they get inside my house? Um, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, um, but I mean, it was like, it was really like... Wait, wasn't oh, it man. me who did your first reading for you? No, before that, before oh, that, like, okay, I've encountered okay. it. But it's, it's, it wasn't stuff like, oh, it's that thing from Persona, or, oh, this is what they told us not to get into at church, like that kind of stuff. <laughs> My first impressions, I got an Instagram ad for an Oracle deck that seemed super, super pretty. It was all rainbow, it was all pastels, and I was like, hmm, I know why Instagram marketed this to me, a 20-something-year-old female. I just know. I just know. <laughs> and I ended up buying it and I ended up buying the panda deck which is from the same creator Kim Tan and I did not know anything about tarot at the time I knew zero about tarot I didn't even know what tarot was from media and I ended up buying the panda deck because I was like oh my god pandas also I've been laid off for months and I'm really bored so cool I'll have a deck of pretty cards and then I ended up just watching her videos on YouTube I ended up just absorbing a lot of videos on YouTube that's how my first impressions of tarot came. So I had a very clean slate impression, to be honest. I didn't get sucked into any of the mysticism before that. Nice, nice. Yeah, I think we have pretty similar experiences with folks in the chat so far. Let me see. I know one person say that I collect pretty cards. I'm not great at reading, though. Yeah, that's me, pretty much. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a big learning curve for sure especially because there's a lot of information about tarot out there. Um, and of course, we're just adding to the information pile. It can be overwhelming to figure out like, where do you start and how do you start? Someone asks, are the cards as gendered as, as they look? That's a very good question. Very good thing to consider. Someone says, I have a hard time wrapping my sass mind around the idea of reading for other people. Ooh, that's a good point. Someone mentions Christian background, tarot evil. Justin, you have experience with Christianity, right? Yeah, I was raised Catholic. I think the church's official stance is don't do any future readings with this. Only God knows or something like that. Is that how they sound? <laughs> well, no, I have to put on an a really bad <laughs> Italian accent for that one. But uh... <laughs> Oh, no, Someone's... that was not Italian. That was... <laughs> 
don't know what it was, but it was very no. funny. I just don't want someone to enter my house at night and beat me to death with a <laughs> bunch of spaghetti. Oh my god. <laughs> someone said it ended up being a cure to decision paralysis for me. Yeah, that I feel that way too. All right. Feel free to continue um, typing. We're gonna. <laughs> someone said someone supports your bad Italian accent, so <laughs> you're on the right track, Justin. This is a very accurate representation of Catholicism, exactly. <laughs> Take it out of the house. We do not want it, Justin. This is the house of the Lord. Oh my God, we're gonna move on now, bro. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. All right. So the first section here. What is tarot? The definition that I have chosen to put in here that I wrote myself. Tarot is a divination system of pictures on cards that follows a specific structure in 78 cards. So let's debunk a few misconceptions right off the bat. You need to be psychic or religious to learn the tarot. There are people out there or sources that say you, do, you need to have some sort of psychic gifts. You need to believe in certain things to be able to use or learn the tarot. Actually, tarot, like anything else, is very personal. Um, it just depends on all of your own religious, spiritual, or, and, or magical beliefs. Um, some people use tarot in conjunction with their deities, even like their Christian deities. Some people use tarot to convene or communicate with like their own spirit guides. They use tarot to talk or, you know, convene with fairies. Um, but also you can be secular. You can use it secularly. You don't have to believe or follow any of those things. And or you can follow those things and still use tarot only in a secular manner. And hopefully... Again, throughout this presentation, we'll also explain what does it mean to use it secularly. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. And here's misconception number two. Tarot is a mystical fortune-telling tool. Ooh. Actually, you know, at, at the end of the day, tarot cards are pictures on paper. You know, the mysticism aspect is up to you, right? Like, we were talking about being raised under certain religions and experiencing certain aspects of their stance on tarot cards and i mean technically like they can be reconciled right like for example the catholic church says they really don't like it when you try to interpret the future but they never said anything about you know like one person described um using it as a psychological tool to help with their mental health right like it depends like the whole um intention and everything but Really, it's up to you how you want to treat the cards. And also, please be careful of appropriating Romani um, aesthetic. As far as I could tell from online, um, a lot of them really don't like the whole fortune teller stereotype. I think one person on Reddit said that their mom would literally throw them out the house if they caught them with tarot cards. <laughs> so that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, seconding the mysticism is up to you. Like Some, some people are very into the mystical part, and other people kind of like myself, are really not mystical at all. So there's a spectrum, and it's okay to be on any part of the mysticism or not spectrum. Yeah, and misconception number three, tarot is the devil's work. All right, actually, look, if the devil wanted to get your ass, he wouldn't wait for you to open some cards, right? Like, it doesn't really make any sense there. Um, also, tarot cards start off as playing cards. I believe they were all originally referred to as Trionfi cards back in Italy, all way back in somewhere in the medieval period. But basically, you don't you don't need to worry about summoning Satan in the middle of your house by opening a pack of cards. Like it's all good. <laughs> now, if you want to, well, <laughs> that's out of our expertise, so you might have to consult a second source for that. <laughs> so, what is divination? This is also a word that I did not understand or know when I first started. So, let's clarify now. What is divination? The answer that I've come up with is it's looking for answers about what is unknown. And what is unknown varies for different people, right? So a lot of people think divination is only fortune telling. Um, why I say it's looking for what is unknown is when I'm trying to figure out why I did this thing and I'm using tarot cards to tell me why I did this thing, that's also looking for answers about the unknown because I don't know the reason why I did this. So I'm trying to use tarot cards or some other divination method to look inside me and pull the answer from me. So the unknown can be things outside of yourself, but also can be things within yourself. Where are these answers coming from? Is another common question that people have about tarot cards. Like where, where is this information? Who's telling me these things? So depending on what your own magical or religious beliefs are, you could be talking with deities. You could be talking with your spirit guides, angels, ancestors, the Fae, the universe, TM, your higher self, your own subconscious, even the deck itself could be talking back to you, etc. 
like we've been saying though, it really is just up to you and what feels right for you, what you believe in. For me, I have a hard time believing in my higher self as a concept. So out of all these things, I really only believe the subconscious is talking to me. Sometimes I will feel like the universe is talking to me, but again, it's all very personal and what feels right for you. Other divination methods include, if you've heard of these and you've also heard of divination, reading playing cards, scrying, which is gazing into a crystal ball, geomancy, reading earth, reading bones, runes, reading tea leaves or coffee grounds, doing pendulum stuff, palmistry, you know, reading those lines on your hand that say if you're gay or if you're going to die an early death or not. These are all divination methods and more. So again, if you've heard of these things, you kind of know what divination is. You know, it's like trying to figure out what's going on because you don't know what this shit is right now. Also, I would argue that even a weather forecast can be a divination because you're trying to take information that you kind of know and speculate into the future. So weather forecast is also divination. All right. So someone says, I personally have very gay hands. I'm sure the lines. Yes, I'm sure they knew at birth, right? Like the lines on your palm tell you if you're gay or not. So that is fact. <laughs> oh, my God. Ah. Okay. I'm going to take a sip of water. <laughs> God, imagine you pop out of the womb and the nurse goes, your baby's gay. Hey, look at those hands. <laughs> All right. So uh, the next section we are going to move into is how to tarot. We explained a little bit about what is tarot on the abstract level. Now we're going to get more into it. How to tarot. How do you use a tarot deck? How do you use this physical thing of cards? Great question, Sarah. So there's a bunch of different ways you can use your tarot decks. One way is to use it for readings, right? So readings are, in a nutshell, basically answering a question that you have, right? Maybe you want to ask the cards, I've been feeling sad lately. Um, is there anything I can do about it? Or is there anything that's blocking me? And then you could pull some cards and then interpret those cards to see where these blocks in your life might be. Or you could ask, do I have really gay hands? I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> you, could also use, you could also use tarot decks or prompts, right? Maybe you want to do like in the image to the right, like a mental health check. And then, you know, answer some questions on that spread like, Oh, yeah, like, you know, what can I start doing to better protect my mental health? And then drawing cards that can help you answer questions like these, perhaps providing more insight into your life. Another way is to use them as inspiration. You know, people like to, I've seen so many spreads online where it's like, oh, how to write a story. The first card is your beginning act one sequence. Uh, card two is your inciting incident. You know, there's lots of different ways to use tarot cards for inspiration. One of the biggest examples that I know of um, is obviously the Persona series, as well as JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, where they incorporate these cards directly into the narrative. And lastly, you can also use tarot decks to play games, right? If any of y'all are in the tarot channels, some of you may remember the writing game that I shared on there a while back. Essentially, you use cards to write a story under the Kisho Tenketsu framework and doing it under certain constraints. And also, going back to like its origins, right, as playing cards, you can play stuff like French tarot. Um, if I remember correctly, the American equivalent of it would be something like bridge, right? But I think bridge. they mostly play this in Europe. Yeah. And I also want to clarify what readings mean, because for someone who didn't, who doesn't understand what readings is, like the way that I see it, readings is kind of like a feel for things. So if we pretend we're psychic for a moment, you're trying to get a reading on a situation. For me, it's the same as like, you're trying to get a feel for something. You're trying to get a feel for like what the energy's like, what's going on, what's the purpose, what's the goal. So a reading can just be like an insight into a situation or a feel about a situation. How to use a tarot deck. You can use it for these purposes. These are all secular purposes that I've gathered together. So you can reflect on how the self is doing or feeling. You ask your cards, you know, how am I feeling today? Um, how can I best use my energy today? Self-reflection in that sense. You can explore possible approaches or outcomes. Um, cards, please tell me what might happen if I act in this manner. What might happen if I act in this other manner? You can guess future results. And of course, it's up to you how you want to use your deck or not. Um, personally, I'm okay with guessing future results because I see the cards as suggestions rather than outright predictions. So me drawing 
a supposedly negative card doesn't mean that outcome is guaranteed to happen. It's just a suggestion, like this might happen. So I should kind of get a heads up and like broaden my mind and be open to that possibility. You can use a tarot deck to set goals and intentions. Deck, tell me um, what's a goal I should be working towards right now. Or deck, tell me what should I focus on in this upcoming project. You can use it for affirmations. Deck, tell me I'm having a really crappy day. Please tell me something good that I'm grateful for right now. Oh yes, or please tell me something good about myself. And it tells you you're a great person. You're like, oh great, cool, thanks. I'm solved, my depression's solved. <laughs> All right, obviously. Easy. Easy peasy, obviously JK there. Um, but also motivational messages too. And more. Personally find that a tarot deck is really helpful in conjunction with my regular life coaching or therapy work that I do. That's a topic for another day, you know. But again, secularly, there's a lot of ways that you can use tarot. And again, and more. There's so many more ways that you can think about it if you just figure out what works for you. So here are some visual aids on how we can use a tarot deck. So one example is by using spreads. So if you look over here, for example, on this left side, we have a spread of three cards. So the idea is you lay down three cards, you assign certain position names to them. Let's say I have a tarot presentation project coming up because I have to talk about tarot. So I'll draw a card for number one. This card will represent my desire for this presentation. Card two will represent the obstacle I might face or that I am facing in this presentation. Obstacle three is resolution. So because these positions are so open, I could read this third position as, this is the resolution I'm looking for, or this is a resolution that might happen, or this is a way for me to get the resolution. So this is an example of a spread of cards. And here's another example here that Justin will explain. Yeah, so this is one of my personal favorites because I end up, I usually end up getting a lot of love readings from people who are interested. Um, this is a three-card relationship spread, I believe, from Labyrinthos. The card on the left is for um, whoever you're asking a question about in terms of the relationship. The card on the right is about you, the person asking the question. And the card in the middle represents the relationship between you two. And this is a great example of using layout as a visual metaphor for helping you understand connections between cards, because you could have easily just put it as card one, you, and then card two, me, right after that, and then right after that, card three, relationship. But by putting that relationship card in the middle, now you have a much more interesting layout where you can start imagining things as, oh, okay, now... I'm really seeing this, you know, this uh, reading in terms of that relationship as a connection between these two uh, entities or cards. Yeah, I like the I like calling it a visual metaphor. Um, and we'll backtrack a moment here again. If you look at this, this is another example of a spread. You know, this mental health check. So here's a list of prompts. Each card position represents a certain prompt, and you know, you just slot cards in and you kind of try to interpret them within the constraints of this question. The idea is having these pictures on cards in front of you will help reflect back like things you know or might have forgotten about yourself. So yeah, those are examples of um, a couple examples of spreads. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and also, you might think, oh, do I really have to learn all these different cards all at once and then you know interpret multiple ones at the same time? Like, not really. Like. It's perfectly fine to start off with a single card. If you look at the image here on the right, you see a card placed on an altar. It seems like this person is really meditating on the meaning of the Two of Pentacles, and that's perfectly fine. You'd be surprised how many people are just like, yeah, you know what? I don't really feel like doing a whole Celtic cross today or even three cards. I'm just going to pull a single card and call it a day. Like, that's perfectly okay. Go at your speed. And don't be afraid to really focus on one card when you want and many of them when you want to. Yeah, people like to do single card pulls like this, not only as an answer to a question or a reading, but you can also use this like little altar or a single card display. You can just use it as like a focus for the day or like a little manifestation, which for me is another term for focus, really. Like I'm going to put this card because I want to try to focus on having balance in my life. So I'm going to put this two of pentacles up or... I just want a little decorative space for guests to see when they come into my home. So I'm going to put this little card here. So there's many ways you could use a little, little card like this. Here's an example of like a big spread. Some people like to do bigger spreads like this. And of course, it might seem overwhelming to a new person. But also, if you like visual metaphors, like Justin said, if you like playing around with cards, if you like laying out cards and looking fancy, that's what I like to do. It feels very cool. So, you know, 
This doesn't have to be a point of overwhelm. It can also just be a point of, you know, fun. Like, let me just put down a bunch of cards, swap them around a little bit, see what shapes I can make. Oh, cool. Another way of using a tarot deck is to do journaling prompts. So here's an example of someone using the Nine of Pentacles. They started writing, focus on your purpose and use it to attain your wealth. So it really is just a picture on a card. So you can use this picture to journal about it and how it applies to you. And lastly, sometimes you need to send a message. Sometimes your friend just doesn't get the hint. And sometimes you can use the cards to spell out this message very clearly in a very concise way that gets the point across. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sarah, we have a question from someone. Let's see. Can multiple decks be used at the same time? Yes. And of course, with the caveat, they don't have to be used at the same time. But for people who have multiple decks, you totally can. Some people love to mix and match decks for one reading. Some people like to organize their decks and like kind of designate them for certain like readings. There are common practices, but there's no tarot Bible. There is no Bible that you have to swear on and like swear to follow for the rest of your life. Um, people have used tarot and oracle decks at the same time. People have used two or more tarot decks at the same time. Oh, an example I could think of is what if I want to do a relationship reading between me and like my partner? Maybe I'll do, I'll use one tarot deck to represent like how I'm feeling, what my goals are. And then I'll use the second tarot deck to represent like how my partner's feeling and what his goals are. And then maybe if I want to be extra fancy, I'll use a third deck to represent what our shared relationship looks like and what our, you know, what their goals are. <laughs> like the possibilities are endless. The fun of it is like looking at pretty pictures and like getting meaning out of it. That's the fun of divination. You're trying to take this random stuff and like make meaning out of it. That is the whole fun of divination. Yeah. Real quick, leading off into the next question someone had, um, do you ever find certain tarot decks better for one type of use slash question and some better for others? Uh, yes, personally, um, for example, I have a standard Raider Weight Smith deck. But whenever I have uh, relationship and love questions and romance questions, uh, which is pretty often, what I do is break out the Tarot Art Nouveau deck because that one is very, is very sensual. Like, you know, lots of, lots of people showing off some skin, you know what I mean? Getting very it's close, very, very intimate. Yeah, curvy. And, uh, you know, for that, I feel it's, it's very helpful for me because I'm like, yeah, I'm really, I'm really feeling it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, not gonna lie. Sometimes I f I get like very white energy. I'm just I'm just feeling it when I'm doing those readings with that specific deck. Uh, yeah. But there's lots of different decks out there for lots of different situations. I think the more that I work with tarot and the more that I try to like sit down and slow down, for the most part, a lot of my decks personally are pretty versatile. I've used them for like shadow work, which is confronting uncomfortable things about myself. I've used the same deck for like guessing future stuff i've used the same deck for relationship stuff so for me i don't have as much like compartmentalized vibes for each deck but i i'm i'm trying to work towards understanding what that looks like for me uh oh yes one more comment before we move on someone says yeah there's no tarot bible but that feels overwhelming too so many options eek and yes a hundred percent there are a billion videos on youtube and a bajillion words on the internet telling you about tarot take it one step at a time or 10 steps at a time, whatever feels right for you. But um, this is the glory and also the pain of not having a structured class. <laughs> Although there are tarot classes out there too. So the world really is your oyster. <laughs> All right, moving on. We have another audience participation moment here. So the querent comes to you. They're sitting across your table and they ask you, what should I do about my relationship? If you don't feel like you want to read for someone else, then you are the queer. You are your own queer. Maybe you're asking yourself this question. So someone's asking, what should I do about my relationship? You draw one of these two cards. You draw the card heartbreak or you draw the card rest. So please pick either card as an answer or a prompt for this question and write your interpretation in the chat. And again, this could be someone else you're reading for, or it could just be yourself that you're reading for. If you hated literature classes in high school, well, I got news for you. <laughs> We're back in literature class, baby. Semiotics majors are fiercely <laughs> typing at the keyboard, trained for this specific moment.
while people are typing, I want to mention that for people who want to get into reading cards and more basically just reading pictures on cards, um, there are things called Oracle decks out there too. So if you're interested in reading cards, but maybe the structure and resources about tarot are intimidating, there are Oracle decks. Um, they don't follow a universal structure like tarot decks tend to do. So there are Oracle decks out there that literally have these different keywords on them, heartbreak or rest. Um, there's other keywords that tend to be like transformation or choices or things like that. So I have a few Oracle decks myself. So that's another thing to look into if you're intimidated by the structure of tarot decks. All right, let me glance at these interpretations here. Someone mentioned getting hanged man vibes from the rest card. That's a very nice mm -hmm. observation. I didn't realize it when I chose this meme, I mean card. Um, <laughs> lots of uh, lots of chilling out from some of these. <laughs> True. Yes, Oracle decks. <laughs> Our next hour-long presentation will be about Oracle decks. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, God. It'll be two hours long. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> you ever heard of the Grand Tableau? <laughs> <laughs> Get ready for our six-hour seminar <laughs> oh, God. about the fool card. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, six hours later, and that was one card in the 78-card deck. Y'all ready for round two? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Um, there are some really nice uh, Oracle decks on Etsy. Yeah, I've encountered some really interesting ones. Like, I think there's a... There's a Korean Oracle deck that uses imagery from playing cards, Korean playing cards. That was pretty interesting. Let's see. Um, should we go over some of the responses really quick, Sarah, or should we uh, move on? Let's see. I'm looking at some of them. There's a lot of upvotes and stuff. Um, I wonder if I have anything to summarize. L let me think. Let me take a moment. I should have taken a moment to think about what I would have said too. Um, no, honestly, I probably would have said something that someone has already said here. So, yeah. Do you have anything you want to say about the comments? I'm okay with just moving on. Um, I I probably would have said something similar. Maybe for rest, I'd be like, yeah, just you know, just hang around, chill out, <laughs> take a step back. <laughs> <laughs> Got him! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> All right, well. For anyone who has never read cards before, give yourself a clap or a pat on the back because you have just done your first card reading. Yeah, we made up these cards and you read a card in an answer to a relationship. That's a reading right there. Cool. All right. Now we're going to go to exercise part two. Question again. What was a lesson I learned last week? So this is a more personal question. Feel free to apply this question to yourself and your personal circumstances. So the card that you draw, we had the light series tarot, the sun on the left, and the chrysalis tarot, the sun on the right. Yes, the sun is a real tarot card. And this is an example of how different decks will illustrate different cards differently. So pick either card as an answer or prompt and write your interpretation in the chat. What was a lesson I learned last week? All right, now I'm gonna take a moment and try to think of an answer for this too. I got one. I learned last week that living in California is a mistake. Stop! Oh my god, you're- no, you're not wrong though. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Dude, oh. It, it hit like 115, like, it, near Sacramento. I was like, oh my god. Okay, but I can't even imagine how bad it is for people who don't live by the coast, you know? Like, Texas oh, yeah. and all the oh, other inland god. state and other countries. Laughs in desert. Oh my god. <laughs> You're not. You're really not wrong, though. Okay, I have an. I have an answer for myself too. So, what was a lesson I learned last week? The sun. So for me, the vibes I get from this card, especially when putting together this presentation and practicing it, I'm learning that it is okay for me to be happy. It's okay for me to do things that almost seem senseless, like this person. Like when when I was growing up, I would never. I, I never like frolicked around in the park or in a flower field, like with my shoes off, um, enjoying the sun. I was always inside studying. A part of me always regrets or laments the fact that I just spent so much time indoors studying, partly because I kind of had to, because I took a lot of extracurriculars, but also partly because I just thought I really enjoyed studying. I mean, I do, but also I wish I'd gotten the chance to like be outside and be friendly more. So. How that ties into, you know, now this question for me is last week while putting this presentation together, 
I felt really happy to be doing a presentation on something that I enjoyed that isn't for school, that isn't for a grade, that isn't really like practical by any means, but it just made me feel really happy. And I think that's a fun lesson to learn, you know, like it's okay to do happy and almost nonsensical things. It's okay to be happy. So that's my answer. Very nice. My answer using the chrysalis tarot, because <laughs> damn, that's relatable, is uh basically like, <laughs> it's all about the highs and lows, right? Like the L's you take go hand in hand with the dubs that you get, right? Like even sometimes like beautiful things can come out of your worst moments. Even if you think the world is ending. Let me see. Someone says, I learned that rest vacation time from my ADHD brain can look lazy cluttered. I can let myself follow the dopamine without judgment. Yeah, that's relatable. Where's that same react? <laughs> Someone said it was their first week at work last week. It was my first week too. Oh, congrats to you for making friends. Oh, you went out with them too. That's, that's great. Yeah, we're all very positive here. Yeah, that's a good point because I also wanted to mention with a tarot deck and because how open interpretations are, hmm, there are standard or common meanings. Like a lot of people will associate sun with like positivity and like happiness, but also there can be, this is where like the literature analysis metaphor brain comes in because the sun can represent happiness, but also depending on every individual or your personal associations, it can also be something negative. It can represent like maybe someone who is too optimistic or too like toxically positive. Like they're telling you like, oh, things are going to be fine. And you're like, well, they don't feel fine. They feel really shitty. And I'm going to allow myself to feel shitty. It can also represent like burning out maybe because you're giving too much or you're shining too much um, or literally burning out because it's too freaking hot outside. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, as much as there are positive meanings for the sun and other tarot cards in the deck, there can also be um, negative. And I even say positive or negative with a grain of salt because it's all just a spectrum. But maybe that's getting beyond the scope of Tarot 101. So, you know, just, I guess that's just an example of, you know, the, the spectrum of how Tarot can be read. Uh, someone asked, do I use reverse cards? Do we use reverse cards? Personally, I don't physically read reversals. I don't physically shuffle reversals in, but when I'm doing a reading, I will try to consider the reversed meanings as well. Justin, do you use reverse cards? Oh yeah, all the time. I personally like them because, you know, they give like a different perspective um, on certain situations. And I've personally found value in them. And I think my querents have as well. Yeah. Okay. So to recap, interpreting tarot cards comes from many different sources. What you see in the card, you know, a lot of people drew from what they visually see here. Other people's meanings for the cards, you know, other tarot books, the guidebooks can tell you what this card means, your own associations with this card. So even if you don't see it here, maybe you personally already associate the sun with like certain feelings and more. Lots of sources you can draw from to interpret tarot cards. Think of your high school literature class, right? Where they're like, oh my gosh, what does the color of this dress mean? What does the number of petals mean here? What does the number of eyes mean on this card? Like you can use any of those details to like create meaning. Again, that's what divination is, creating meaning from something um, and if you came up blank that's fine too reading cards is a learned skill again if you hated like all the analogies and metaphor stuff it might take a little bit of time for you to get used to this so it's all fine you know it's all fine all right so now that being said we're gonna move into tarot structure woo we're gonna talk a little bit about what exactly is tarot structure what are these 78 cards all about if you feel overwhelmed, remember that this is for fun in all caps. We're nerding out for fun, you know, all fun and games. Tarot cards can be categorized into many different categories, but one of the types of cards is called the Major Arcanum. It's also called the Trump Cards, going back to their playing card origins. These are actually a really good place to start with learning tarot, right? Like they're the most, some of the most iconic imagery in the deck. They're also some of the most common in media which we'll talk about in a bit but the thing about the major arcanum is that they can also be read as a story and this is called the fool's journey where the fool at the very top is someone who is you know who has to learn a lesson and towards their journey on becoming one with the world and becoming attuned with everything around them you know they meet different people or come across different people in situations that each teaches them one aspect of their goal. And we see this a lot in media. For example, in the Persona franchise, 
the fool card is often associated with you, the player character, who has to learn something along the way. And you can also see the fool's journey in various stories. For example, one of the biggest examples I know of is Forrest Gump, right? The way that Forrest Gump is structured is very much like the fool's journey because he's someone who ends up meeting all these different characters and just like learning different things along the way from each of them. And can we be can we be Persona Fanatic Weeb friends, sir? I w- I'll say this. I've I've only played Persona 2 so far, but yes, I would love to geek out about it. Sarah? DM Justin. <laughs> just kidding. Um, uh-huh. But yeah, also, if you heard of The Hero's Journey, I studied The Hero's Journey in school. I feel like it's pretty similar to The Fool's Journey. We have Minor Arcana as well in the tarot. The Minor Arcana are divvied up into four different suits. If you're familiar with Avatar, The Last Airbender, if you're familiar with the four elements in any media, earth, water, rock, No, sorry. Earth is rock. Water, earth, fire, air. Like, you're already familiar with a little bit of tarot suits. We've got the cup suit, which is associated with water. We've got the pentacle suit, which is associated with earth. We've got the wand suit, which is associated with fire. And we've got the sword suit, which is associated with air. And a lot of books and resources will, of course, go into what these suits represent. Like, water is all, like, emotions and fire is all passion and whatever. But even... Just glancing at you, you might be able to come up with some associations for yourself, what these elements mean. Within each suit, they are numbered from ace through 10. We've got numbers. People commonly see the numbers within each suit as progression. So we start from the ace, which can represent like an initial spark. And then as we go on through the suits, you see how five, the midway point, suddenly there's a lot of clashing energy um, and a lot of energy starts conflicting and stuff. And then we move on through the six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The ten seems to have a very heavy energy compared to the one or the ace. You know, the ten, this guy looks like he, this person, looks like they're super overwhelmed and overburdened compared to the light, airy feeling of the ace. Also, different decks will illustrate things differently. So if you don't really see or understand this Rider Waite Smith deck, that's okay. Maybe another deck will help visualize it better for you. But yeah, brief explanation. There are numbers in the tarot deck. They might mean a progression. Numbers tend to have meaning as well. If you're into that, cool. There's also inside the ma- the minor arcanum, by the way. It's singular, Sarah. Um, <laughs> uh, there's also court cards, right? Where, you know, you have like the page, the knight, the queen, and the king who all make up the different members of a royal court. And they could all be, per- each one could be different personalities in your life. They can also represent various stages of progress, right? Like maybe you're the page when it comes to learning about tarot cards, right? But by the end of this presentation, maybe you'll become the knight. Or, you know, after a couple of years of reading, maybe you'll become a queen. And then after 9,000 years and intense (laughs) studying all day long, you will become the king. And for reference, I included characters of four at the bottom just to illustrate how sometimes like different people can be different members of the court at any given point. For example, if you're really into Game of Thrones, you could be like Tywin Lannister, dude's totally the king of swords, right? Cersei or uh, maybe even Tyrion are the queen of swords. Then maybe Jaime is the page of swords because he's still at the beginning of his journey, right? Like there's lots of different ways to interpret this. I find that, you know, thinking about your favorite characters and trying to think about what, where their current personality is at a certain point in time is a great way to really, you know, kind of think about the court cards in a sense. And I want to add slash emphasize through all of these different cards that we've showcased, hopefully we've sh- we're showing that tarot is really just a bunch of different archetypes and different labels all compiled into one deck. So, you know, again, from the fool's journey with the fool, the hermit, death, those are archetypes. And these pages, knights, queen, kings, those are also archetypes. So if you're familiar with literature, you might pick up on these a little bit more. But if you're not as familiar with literature, like I'm really not a literature person, it took me some time to read up on these and understand like what they mean. So another audience participation question. I think this is the last one we have for this uh, slideshow. Which suit or element feels most relevant for you right now? We've got the wands, the coins or pentacles, the swords, the cups. Feel free to drop an emoji or type it out in the chat. What suit or element are you right now, Sarah? 
I think, oh, for sure, leading up to this presentation, I felt a lot of the SWORDS energy because I really wanted to make sure that it was informational, that it was efficient and effectively informational. I was trying to like reason out, you know, like what is most relevant for people to know? What is like helpful? What should I add in? Trying to like really logic it out. Um, on the flip side of SWORDS energy, it also became very self-critical too. It becomes overthinking. See, I think right now I'm definitely the cups. Been having some emotional shock waves recently. Not mm -hmm. very fun, but I am working towards from the cups. I'm working towards entering the world of the wands. Ooh. You know, ambition, power, intuition. I'm trying to make some power moves out here. Yeah. Because your boy got bills to pay. <laughs> so I hope that um, through this exercise, you can see that it's all archetypes. It's all concepts. It's all metaphors, analogies, all this. It's like using abstract concepts to try to make our lived experiences more understandable for us. I have a visual representation to help me understand better. Like, what does wants energy look like? Oh, maybe wants energy is when I decide to start five new crochet projects without actually finishing any of them. You know, what does cups energy look like? Maybe cups looks like when I try to focus on what actually makes me happy versus just starting projects. I think one thing I just want to mention is that based off of everyone's answers in the chat, I hope this all helps some of you understand that these are great ways to kind of segment the way we experience the world, right? Yeah, segment. Like maybe sometimes, yeah, like it's easier to organize your thoughts according to these four categories rather than thinking, oh, I'm, I really feel like floaty and not very like I'm all over the place, but I'm also feeling really emotional and it might seem like one thing at first, but you can also separate them, compartmentalize, and that's a-okay. All right. We are on the last section now. Thank you all for staying here thus far. We have made it through tarot theory. Are you ready for tarot reality? How do you become like Yu-Gi-Oh, sir, here? How do you become a master card slinger like this guy? <laughs> well, have fun with it. Tarot cards can be serious and fun. Have a laugh. In fact, have three laughs. Be empowered and or comforted by this. Don't be distressed. At the end of the day, we're all here to have a good time with the cards. And yes, believe in the heart of the cards. And there's no pressure to memorize them, right? Like, <clears throat> there's guidebooks and websites <clears throat> that you can just consult online or in a book. Even in my readings, like sometimes I'm like, ooh, what, what does a, what's a three of hearts again? I, I should probably look this up. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's all, it's A-OK. -okay. We're all still learning. There's some people who have been reading the cards for 20 years, right? Like, it's a journey. Just like with every other topic and, and thing in life, some people are very serious about it. And some people just dabble in it. People who dabble in tarot, like, they might need to use a, they might want to use a guidebook um, or reference every time they do a reading. And that's totally fine. Some people are hella nerdy for some reason. And they like to consume hours and hours of YouTube videos and books about the meanings and it's almost like second nature. So individual preference, you know, wherever you fall or feel in the spectrum, all cool with you. Also with the distress part, this presentation is like an hour at this point already. And this is supposed to be a 101 thing. I hope it shows just how much there is to learn about tarot. There's different systems. There's different decks. There's different creators. There's different history books on tarot. There is a lot. The fun and the pain of not having a structured class is that like you kind of get to choose where you want to start first. So. Like Justin said, empowered and are comforted. Don't feel distressed. It's all fine. It's all for fun. On the topic of having fun is there are tons of cool decks out there. We are so lucky to be living in the age of the internet where people, um, especially like secular folks, people who are non-white, people who are not straight, um, not cis, like they get to create decks too and put their art out on the market. You don't have to stick to the traditional or the classic decks, you know? If I had seen like Rider Waite Smith tarot or other like mystical classic decks when I first got into tarot, I might not have gotten into tarot. So I'm lucky that my first ever tarot deck was literally a panda, a watercolor panda deck. There's different aesthetics, different vibes, different moods, and different prices. So there's really a different kind of deck for every type of interest out there. Like look at this entire shelf. And this isn't even like 10% of all the decks that are out there. I'm promising you there's a bajillion decks out there. Here's another example of all the different art in the decks. I think someone earlier asked a question about like, do decks have different meanings and like, why are they different? Um, so here's an example. Um, Mixed Just Ray on YouTube, she made 
a whole video. It's called Unfair Comparisons Ultimate, all my tarot decks. So she took all of her tarot decks out and she literally flips through all of the cards one by one comparing each deck. So if you look at the full card from all of these decks, like you have the classic Rider Waite Smith in the middle here. You have, um, you know, Rider Waite Smith clone, the modern witch over here. But then look at all the different ways that people have illustrated the full card. You get different vibes. This card here seems to have, some of them follow the same like going off a cliff vibe, but others of them, actually there's a lot of cliff here. You know, this card down here on the bottom, like this, there's no cliff here, but there's a feeling of being a fool here. This person is like ripping, are they ripping out their beard? Is that what they're doing? <laughs> that's a, that's okay, an interesting that, question. It, I don't want to say ripping out. That sounds really violent. Maybe they're just, they're shedding their beard. You know, they're starting anew. Oh, this one here is like, it's a birdie. There's no cliff over here, but it's a baby bird. So this is an example of how different decks will illustrate concepts differently. And... Many of them might generally mean the same thing, but there's different nuances in each deck that make the deck's art and the decks feel unique to you. Yeah, and also don't forget, there are tons of cool resources. Did I mention they're free? Um, you know, first and foremost, got plenty of YouTube videos, you know, beginner tutorials like uh, Lisa Pappas's amazing Tarot with Training Wheels lessons. You also have, you know, various books and audiobooks. One book that I got was The Kitchen Table Tarot. That was a really fun book for me. Um, and I feel like it was also a very good introduction for beginners and very accessible as well. And there's also different podcasts. Like Sarah put me on to Three Fat Readers on YouTube. This is also a podcast or I guess YouTube content with Lisa Papez in it. And I love their energy. They have some amazing synergy between them. It's great. And you can also use websites and apps, right? Like there's Labyrinthos, which is a great free app for learning and practicing tarot. In fact, I actually started out with this even before I bought my first deck. And uh, <clears throat> if, you, uh, <laughs> if you Google tarot meanings, you get about, oh, geez, I think it's like 5 billion results at least. There's so many different resources out there in order to get started. I know some people might think, oh my God, now I'm overwhelmed again. What's that one Confucius saying? The journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. <laughs> <laughs> um, just pick something, get started. Don't worry about the rest until you're ready to take on more. So one step at a time, one step at a time. One thing I wanna mention is watch out for the hype. As we may have seen, there's a lot of tarot content out there, a lot of new age stuff. And some people will do readings that tend to prey on people's insecurities, such as what does your ex want to say to you? You know, if you're fresh from a breakup or if your breakup's been a while, you're still missing your ex. Like you kind of wonder like, what are they thinking about me? Why aren't they messaging me back? So, you know, people are trying to call out to them and it's really up to you to figure out how you feel about these um, or how true they are for you. I'm not going to comment on like if other people's psychic abilities are valid or not. Even TikTok, like TikTok has a lot of these too, because it's very easy to do short form content on TikTok. So I just want to say TLDR, take readings with a grain of salt. And readings can be, you know, these general readings online, but even your own personal readings or readings that other people do for you. Take them all with a grain of salt. It's like any therapy or any advice or any random words on the internet. Always take it with a grain of salt. Compare them against what you already know and think about if this is the right advice or if this feels right for you. You know yourself best. The last thing we got here is deep or casual. It's all up to you. You know, you can be like this picture on the left where you're all getting really mystical and really building up the ambiance here. You know, you got your nice big cloth, you got your candles, you got the dark mood lighting, or you can be like this person on the right where you just sprawl out your cards on a hotel bed, you know, no cloth, whatever. The most important thing is again, just have fun. This is meant to be a self-help tool, not a self-distress tool. And that concludes our presentation. The initiation is complete. Welcome to the Tarot Nerd Club. Y'all did your first tarot reading with that sun card. Y'all know tarot Ooh. theory. Y'all are ready for tarot reality. You can put tarot reader on your LinkedIn now. Let's go. <laughs> also, I made a playlist of some of my favorite videos and or creators. Like I've mentioned before, just take it once up at a time. No pressure to watch all of the videos all at once. Um, it's meant to be a fun way to explore. But also if you're like me, I literally like, I've been doing this for two years and I still have like 400 tarot videos on my watch later playlist. So 
I just really like absorbing and listening to tarot content. But you know, if it overwhelms, you just take it one step at a time. So woohoo. Thank you. Claps for Justin and claps for y'all who came out. So claps now for we... Sarah, everyone. Don't forget yourself. <laughs> oh, thank you. Claps for me too. I did it. And now we shall open the floor for more questions, more comments. Um, what did y'all think? Are there more burning questions that you have that we can answer at this time? Are there any slides or topics you want to revisit at this time? Questions, comments, favorite cat themed oh. deck. Yes, my favorite cat themed deck is the Mystical Cats Tarot. It is adorable. I like the Mystical Cats Tarot because I find the cats very expressive. I love the variety of cats. I love that the cats feel like cats and they're not just like, they actually act like cats. They don't act like people act like cats. They act like actual cats. They're really, they're really cute. And I love the variety of cats they, they feature in the Mystical Cats Tarot as well. Oh, Sarah. Yes, Justin, what is your question? How many tarot decks you got? Stop! Just kidding. I'm not ashamed. I love my tarot deck collection. I love own, I love having pretty things to look at. I don't collect books, so I feel like having tarot decks is the next best thing for me. Um, let me pull up my list. <laughs> the spicy questions. <laughs> I believe I have 41 decks. Yes. I think 41 is the right answer now. Yeah. And I'm very happy with it. My on the topic of buying and acquiring decks, my first one to two years—well, it's been over two years now. So when I say first one to two years, I just mean over the last couple of years. But over the last couple of years, I have bought a lot of decks. Clearly, like 41 decks. Um, but I feel like it was all—it's all exploration. So I think some people like they do feel shame or they feel guilty for buying decks or having a lot of things. And that's something that I've had to like think about. And that's something that a lot of people in the community are talking about as well. For me. I like all the decks that I have. I'm very happy with them. They're very, they're pretty. I like looking at pretty things. And also we've been going through a pandemic and it's just nice to have like things to escape into and look at in the meantime, you know? How many uh, decks someone... do you have, Justin? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I, I think I have like three. Have? So far. well, I have two tarot decks and I just got a, um, I just got the Letterman deck recently. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's about three for me. Do you think that you are, at this time, do you think that you're interested in like buying a lot more or are you not for whatever reason? Buddy, I'm trying to not get evicted. <laughs> That's very valid. That's very fair too. <laughs> if money wasn't an issue, do you think that you would be buying a lot of decks or would you still only buy like one, once a blue moon? Definitely once a blue moon because mm -hmm. I'm the type who really wants to get to know a deck, you know, before I move on, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Like, I love I love our differences. Yes, civil war. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Now vote. Who's better? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> One's the chat for Justin, y'all. Um, let's see. Ooh. Oh, someone asked. Um, oh, sorry. Go on. Oh, I was gonna ask. Uh, is it the one you can only save one deck from a fire? What deck yeah. is that? It. Yeah. Yeah. Dang. I would do the Way of the Panda one, though. I, I know that's a disservice to all the other ones that I actually still love, but the Way of the Panda just has a special spot in my heart. It's the first deck I got. The creator's Chinese like me. Um, I love that. It's very whimsical, but also serious. It's it's just everything I love and also want to be. Way of the Panda is my answer. How about you? Ooh. Honestly, um, I have to say the Raider Waite Smith Centennial Edition. You know, mm. Just because it's my first deck is one of the things that encouraged me to keep going with tarot. Also, it's like, it's old faithful, right? Like, there's lots of different decks out there, but most of them are based on the RWS at the end of the day. I really love and am fascinated by how you're really into all the classics, and I'm very not classic at all. I'm very much more into, well, I, I, w I was going to say I'm more into modern, but I also am picky about my modern stuff. But yeah, I'm, I'm not into your decks at all. I think that's very cool, though. Well, maybe it's because some of us are educated and cultured. <laughs> I knew you were going to and... say that. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay, someone asked, what's some good resources for how to create your own tarot deck? Hmm. For creating your own tarot deck, well, aside from can you write, can you read, and can you draw? What we mentioned earlier, the Raider-Waite-Smith is like the basis or foundation for a lot of main 
stream tarot definitions out there at the moment. You know, so really understanding those meanings can help you better understand how to create decks that really resonate with you. Let's see. Um, in terms of moving away from the theory, in terms of the practical considerations, right? Like thinking about like card stock and looking into like what's the different kind of card stocks that you want to use because the handle of the cards does matter for a lot of people, right? And also thinking about, you know, what kind of like theme or imagery do you want to include? Because, you know, some people are like, yeah, I really want to base this off of um, maybe like ancient Greek imagery and tie that into tarot. Other people are like, yeah, you know what? Let's get some Simpsons in here. I want to make a I'll make the emperor with Homer's like drinking beer on the couch or something. Right. <laughs> like thinking about how you want to present it as well. Uh, you got any thoughts, Sarah? Yeah. Hmm. How to create your own tarot deck. There is a couple, there's two parts to this if, I, if I'm thinking about it. One is the conceptualization of the tarot deck and the other part is the getting it printed and distributed. So I think for the first part, the conceptualizing it, um, I actually don't know of that many. I'm sure YouTube or Reddit might have some more. Um, ideas. I would trust YouTube more because I feel like deck creators tend to be more on YouTube, maybe Instagram, than on like Reddit. Um, but I did link some um, channels in the chat for how to create, as in like how to get your tarot deck published. So shout out to um, Carrie Mallon. She created the Spacious Tarot. Fables Den, she created the Way of the Panda. Ethany, she created the Modern Love Tarot. Um, I know Natalie Meraki. I forgot what deck she made, but I believe th those are four creators that I know of who have um, videos and stuff out there talking about how they created their decks. So I would look at those first. Someone says they imagine me with giant wall sized bookcases filled with tarot decks. <laughs> Homie, you don't even know. Oh my God. If I lived in a mansion, I would have one room for all my tarot decks. I would have one room for all my board games because those take up a lot of space. I would have one room for all the yarn, not yarn that I'm probably going to use, just yarn that I want to hold and like have in the room and look at. Oh, there's so much. Pretty things are going to be the death of me. <laughs> oh my God. <sighs> oh, wait. Someone's asking, what's your favorite card? Let me grab my way of the panda, take a look. Go for it. Um, I'll start off while Sarah's looking. Uh, for me, at least, my favorite card is... Uh, oh, wow. There's a bunch of them. Um, I'll say at least, just to make it easy, for the Major Arcanum, uh, it's definitely death. Because, you know, at first you're like, uh-oh, there's a skeleton. Mr. Scully's gonna get me. And it's like, Mr. no, not Scully. necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily, right? Like, you know, with a death card, it's not literally about death, but it's metaphorically about change and, you know, re potentially like, like the end of a cycle or something and heralding the beginning of a new one. And that's just a meaning and this sort of imagery that really speaks to me. You know, I'm also, skeletons are also pretty cool. So there's that. Um. <laughs> no, what is my favorite card? I usually don't have... I have I have cards that I like across like within dif different decks, but I don't know if I have a favorite. Actually, I think okay, I think I have one that I've got. All right. So one of the favorite cards that I've chosen is the Judgment card, um, <laughs> particularly or especially this one from the Way of the Panda. The Judgment card tends to be depicted as a trumpet or trombone, like being sounded in your face, telling you to like wake up, get up, do stuff, and. I don't know. It's kind of a nice call to action because I feel like sometimes I get very into my own head. I get into like my own anxieties. I'm like worried or thinking and figuring out like I'm doing a lot of mind work. The judgment card to me is like a call to action. It's like, all right, are you done thinking about things? Are you ready to get up and do stuff? Are you ready to like let go of your fears and like do it? It just makes me feel so motivated. Like you're right, trumpet. I am ready. I'm going to get up and do things. I'm going to get up and seize a day. So yeah, that is one of my favorite cards. Have you ever had a problem card and what was it? Oh, God. <laughs> problem card. Um, at least for me, at the beginning, it was the hanged man. Just because it's like, I don't know, at the time, like I was still new and it's that meaning and imagery just wasn't really like, I don't know, I just had a hard time recalling that one for some reason. And to this day, I think I'm still a little shaky on it, but definitely better than before. 
Um, I haven't had a pop up in a while, mm. so I'll I'll let you know if I <laughs> you <laughs> you'll, bastard you'll again. DM me immediately. <laughs> Yeah, the just justice was a card that I had trouble understanding or figuring out how to make my own for a while because a lot of resources will say justice is about consequences, and I'm like, what does that mean in like an everyday reading? So my own primary definition for the justice card is what is the root of the problem? What is the number one important thing that needs to happen, or the number one important thing about the situation? But this it took me a while to figure out what even this means because again, every guidebook just said consequences or like karma and I don't really believe in karma so I was like I need a book that will finally help me understand how to use this in a reading also because understanding the definition is one thing but then applying it to a question or applying it to your spread about a question is a whole nother thing so I was like just confused for a while about that but I feel like I'm at a good place where I understand justice now for myself all right someone asks uh what does it mean when someone says my tarot card is there are websites that will give you like a formula to calculate what your tarot card is which one of the major arcana is like your tarot card um it's like a website where you plug in your birth date and i think it just adds up all the numbers honestly of your birth date and it tells you like based off the sum of the numbers of your birth year and month and date your tarot card is i think mine is like the lovers and the devil because the numbers add up to like six and oh wait is six it the is a lover's card? card and then 15 is the devil one and five in the devil card add up to six. And, you know, it's up to you how much it's, it's kind of like astrology or zodiac signs. It's like, how much do you want to internalize that? Um, you know, how much do you, do I want to internalize how much the Aquarius means to me versus how much am I just going to like meme about it? How seriously or fun am I going to take it? I guess is what I'm, what I'm saying. Oh yeah. Turn. Oh, okay. I found it funny that my birth cards are the ones I like the most. I got death and the emperor. Wow. I'm an alpha male, guys. Oh my yeah, god. <laughs> <laughs> so you already felt the calling towards the death card before you even knew your birth card. <laughs> All right, someone had asked, how does reading differ from interpreting? I would say it's the same thing. It's kind of like reading a book, right? It's like you're looking at the words, but then you're also trying to understand what the words are trying to say. So I would say reading and interpreting are like the same thing in my mind. Someone asked, are the cards as gendered? I say, look, ooh, this is a good point. I think a lot of the classic decks, there are certain cards in the deck, such as Queen, King, and Emperor, and Empress, that tend to be gendered in classic decks. What's nice about the internet nowadays is that a lot of people nowadays will, I, I want to say they'll kind of gender bend it or just kind of not try, try not to gender the cards at all. I think it is hard still to depict an empress without thinking about our mother figures. Um, but there are decks that depict like male emp- uh, I wish there were more decks that depict male empresses. I don't know. I don't know if my argument's holding up now, chief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I don't think I've seen that many. Um... Well, there is the, um, the what was it? There's like, it's a really popular one on Amazon. I think it was made by a black creator. Um, it's like the one, it's like, it's like that one tarot deck that like every witch has when they start out oh modern yes the modern witch tarot there we go oh that thank one. you yeah true in that deck that person has um take uh the card uh, what is it the modern witch tarot depicts basically all the same rider weight smith scenes and characters but instead they're all like women of slightly different body sizes and different skin tones Speaking of gendered cards, though, actually, there is a thread that was just recently created in the tarot channel in the Sass Witches server. It's called, like, non-gendered and non-human decks because a lot of us, myself included, sometimes we don't want to get into, like, the politics of, like, human existence. Um, so sometimes having, like, decks that just feature plants or that just feature animals or just feature nature are very comforting, too. So I think a lot of queer people, myself included, and or non-white people, myself included, will find comfort in these decks that don't feature people as well. So they're out there too. Someone says, I have a hard time wrapping my sass mind around the idea of reading for other people. That's a good point, um, especially strangers. Yeah, so it was kind of scary for me at first because I was like, well, what if I get it wrong or something? But first and foremost, it's not about being right or wrong. You're never going to be right, quote unquote, 100% of the time. Yeah, and especially because, you know, it's really dependent on how much information you have because your querents will oftentimes come in with their own expectations. And it's like, well, if you the less specific you are, the less 
right I can be with this reading. Like, mm-hmm. it really depends. Strangers, like, I don't think I've read for strangers. Well, I have, technically I have, but they all became friends in the end. You know, it's like that, like Sarah said, um, the journey of a thousand steps begins with one face plant to the ground. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> There is no pressure, no obligation to ever read for other people, as this is a hobby for most of us. Like, you know, we're not getting paid to do this for other people. Um, We can just do things for fun. So, of course, like, there is no obligation at all to ever read for other people if you don't want to. Maybe you'll try it and you'll decide you don't like it. Or maybe you'll try it and you decide you do. That's a caveat there. I think for myself, I, I started reading for people even just a few months into learning tarot. What I think about it now in hindsight, I'm like, what possessed me to, like, have the guts to even do that? But... It has been an interesting journey to get used to reading for other people. So I think now that I'm on the other side, now I feel more level-headed and confident about it. I will say, first of all, reading for people who are SAS helps a lot because it's different from when you're offering readings in another like random tarot group out there and people are like asking about their crushes. They're asking about, um, will I get this job? So I think for me, reading for people who already understood me as a person and understand that I come from a secular perspective, that helped lessen the expectation. When it comes to me doing a reading for other people, like, of course, it can be easy to get really into our heads about, like, I need to deliver, like, the best advice ever because, like, if I'm wrong, this is, like, I don't know, egg on my face. But honestly, like, the querent is open to anything you have to say. They're opening their heart and their mind up for, like, any advice, you know? If it was something that they could have asked a friend or they could have found themselves, then they would have done so. But they're coming to someone to like read cards for them. So they're already kind of placing a little bit of trust and they're kind of open to whatever you have to say. And so the art of reading cards, especially as a secular person, is that you're just placing down cards. You're talking about the associations with the card, what the card might represent. And the querent is like making the connections, connecting the dots between these cards and their own life circumstance. Also like when you listen into someone else's tarot reading, sometimes it can seem like this is just really generic advice. But to the person who's receiving the reading, it can sound really personal and like just what you needed to hear that day. And I find that with like therapy posts that my friend shares or that like I follow on Instagram. I don't follow many therapists on Instagram, but sometimes I find that I see the right post when like I feel like I need to see it. I feel like that kind of synchronicity is something that I have learned to be open to more and trust more the more that I read tarot. Like if I do a reading for Justin right now, right? I pull a card and I'm like, "Um, Justin, you got the Ace of Wands. It means that you're starting... Um, you know, you said that you were moving into the wands energy. The ace means you're starting something new. You're ready for something new. And Justin's like, oh my God, you're so right. And to everyone else listening, it might sound like, okay, everyone's always starting something new. <laughs> like, what is this? But as long as it means something to the person receiving the reading, I think that's that's already the magic of it. See, someone asked about, oh, how far can the creative interpretation go before it's more oracle than tarot? Good question. I mean, with Oracle cards, what I notice is that they tend to be more definitive. Like, there's not as much leeway to interpret a card other, you know, whereas like with a tarot card, you have like a generic meaning, some keywords. You can interpret it in a bunch of different ways. But for example, I know with the Lenderman deck, that one is a lot more like, much more literal, if that makes sense. I would highly recommend in the playlist that I linked... It's from Benabel Wen. It's called something like intuitive tarot, throw out the books, question mark. It helps me with my initial philosophies. And I mention it because a lot of people in the tarot community will say they don't read books. They want to just read intuitively, which is like what their own intuition or gut feeling says about the cards. And so some people believe that you shouldn't read tarot books because you want to go off your own interpretations. For me, the way that I've developed my own tarot practice now is it is part interpretation and it's also part standard meanings. Honestly, I think any tarot deck could be also be considered an oracle deck. Like you really could just throw out the conventions of tarot and just like be creative. And if it happens to line up with some tarot interpretations, it is what it is. I'm not sure if what I'm saying is helpful or if it's like causing more confusion. It can make reading some decks more confusing when they stray far from the suits and such. That is a very good point. There are some tarot decks out there that they, they relabel the suits and they relabel the courts and people who are new to tarot can find that very confusing. I think what's important in approaching decks like that is to really internalize it for yourself. First of all, again, it's totally okay to not like a deck and not pick it up for any reason whatsoever. There's no obligation for you to like buy or keep or use a deck just because other people do. Um, For me, the Spacious Tarot is a deck that renames the court cards, for example. So instead of Page, Knight, Queen, King, they've renamed it like 
student, explorer, guardian, and elder. So it took me a little bit of time to understand and internalize what does being a guardian of something mean to me? What does being an elder of something mean to me? So I would recommend the way to approach them is to sit on them and try to internalize them the way that makes sense for you. Another example is the tarot in space. They've renamed the wands to rockets. The swords are lasers. The cups are comets. Pentacles are planets. So in that instance, same thing. I'm trying to understand like, okay, planets are the earth element because they're the things that we live on. They're the things that give us life. Rockets, the things we try to shoot at and reach new destinations. So part of that is like coming up with your own interpretations um, and personal associations for these suits and things. And also watch reviews because I have heard that the D&D tarot is hard for some people some tarotists even to get a hold of. So oh. you know, feel free to check out other tarot people on YouTube to see like other reviews and other comments on it from other, you know, seasoned readers. D&D tarot, are you referring to the Taroka deck or do they actually have their own like tarot deck? That's the official logo on the cover. Okay. Yeah, I, I did see... hear that there was a D&D deck that came out fairly recently. Oh, okay. I just heard about it now, but I know they actually, they also have their own in-universe um, tarot deck that's that's basically meant to be used for a specific adventure module. Um, if it's that one, then yeah, that one is really weird. But I'll have to look into this new one. Okay, the official one. There are a lot of people who create decks when they might not have or use a lot of tarot knowledge that goes into the deck. Some people like that, and some people yeah. don't. Yeah. There's a, I know um, Three Fat Readers had a whole episode about fan decks oh, and about yeah, how like, decks. yeah, and about how like a lot of them aren't really faithful to the actual tarot meetings for, you know, reasons that, for a lot of reasons that are outside of the creator's direct control. If you're looking to get like more themed decks like the Dungeons and De uh, Dragons tarot or like a Nightmare Before Christmas tarot deck. Um, definitely look up reviews to see how well they stuck to the actual or the original um, meanings and imagery. Um, that person said, definitely more D&D than tarot. So cool, but not a good tarot learning deck. Yeah, mm -hmm. I. Mm -hmm. all the really fun decks are like terrible for actually reading. <laughs> I know. I hate it. Yeah, oh, let's well, see. The yeah. spectrum of human human art artisticness right yeah there's a the person who the original artist for final fantasy um yoshitake amano i know he had a really cool tarot deck that he put out but it turns out he just drew like the the major arcanum and then for the minor arcanum it's like really like lazy pips and it's like i'm not paying 48 bucks for this get out of here <laughs> lazy pips <laughs> <laughs> Like, there are cool pips, you know, but, like, there, there's there's also just, like, I mean, really, this is it? Like, <laughs> Yeah, and for those who don't know what pips are, pips are, like, minor arcana where they're not illustrated fully. Four pentacles is just four coins drawn out on the deck, and then five pentacles is just five coins drawn out. So that would be considered a pip deck instead of having fully illustrated scenes for the four of pentacles or the five of pentacles. Someone asked a question at the beginning, are all decks the same aside from aesthetics? And I think we touched upon it. There's like three major systems of tarot. One is the Rider Waite Smith tarot, which is that one deck of like medieval looking white people that we kind of showcase a little bit. And a lot of resources will base their information on the Rider Waite Smith tarot. But there's also what's called the Thoth or the Toth. I really don't know how to pronounce it. T-H-O-T-H. That's another like tarot system that is similar, but also very different from the Rider Waite Smith system. There's also a system called Tarot de... Marseille. The Rider Waite Smith one is by far the most popular and thus the most common deck that people will base their tarot interpretations and meanings and art off of. But there are also deck creators who will make decks based off of like, you know, Toth or Marseille. So those are also examples of different decks that differ more than just aesthetics. Like their whole system um, is different as well. There's a whole lot to be said about different decks. Um, and I think the best way to just understand it is by watching deck collection videos or watching deck comparison videos um, or even deck walkthroughs if you want to see more about how decks can be different. I watch a lot of deck walkthroughs but even for decks that I know I'm not going to buy because maybe the person who's presenting it is really interesting or the deck itself just seems kind of interesting and I want to see like how they did certain cards and certain concepts. Someone had asked how do different layouts change interpretations of the card? Ooh, that's a good question. 
if you remember, we w- we had talked about tarot spreads, which are different layouts of the cards. The different spread positions will prompt you on how to read the cards. So if I want to ask a two card spread, one card says, what should I be grateful for? One card says, what should I release from my life? You can put a card in either of those positions or you can swap the cards and that will change the interpretation of the cards already. I need to head out, Sarah, but it's been nice wow, talking with it's everyone. it's been that long already. Yes. It's been nice talking with everyone. Um, nice meeting all of you too. Thank you so much for coming to listen to us talk about tarot cards. I hope you all have more fun with Sarah after I leave. <laughs> I will escape Bye, to the ethereal realm. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. All right. I will wrap up the last couple of questions. Someone says, how do you personally narrow down the multiple meanings of a card to just the relevant one? That's a good question. Let's say I'm asking myself the question, what am I grateful for today? And I pull the two of pentacles. And so I'm going to use my reference, learntarot.com, because it has like a bajillion meanings that I can use. So I'm going to think about what actually is happening or what has already happened today. One of the meanings here says juggling, keeping everything in balance. Do I feel like I have kept things in balance? I don't feel like I really did much today to keep things in balance. Like I went out to brunch and then I'm doing things now, but I don't feel like I'm juggling anything. So maybe that meaning doesn't really work. And the second meaning I see here is being flexible, such as adapting quickly, going with the flow. So actually that makes sense to me. So maybe being flexible is something that I'm grateful for. Like I'm glad that I had open space that I didn't have to rush off after an hour or I had you know extra time to hang out. I have extra time to do whatever I want today without a rigid schedule. So maybe I am grateful for having a flexible schedule. The third bullet point in this website also says having fun. So that's also something I can be grateful for today, having fun. You know, out of all these meanings, the second one is what feels most relevant to the question and to myself as it applies today, being flexible. So that's a quick example of how I try to narrow down meanings. That's also why a tarot reading can take a while for people who are new to tarot and or have a lot of cards. I hope that was a helpful example. Do I have a favorite way to shuffle? That is a very good question. My favorite way is to riffle shuffle the deck. I cut the deck in half. I hold each half in my middle and fourth finger and my thumb and I just riffle. That's the riffle shuffle. Huge thank you again to everyone who came out, everyone who attended at any time, any point in the presentation. And again, a huge shout out to everyone in the tarot and divination channels, because if it weren't for this community to be able to talk to and learn from, I wouldn't be here where I am now. All right, y'all. Well, without further ado, we shall close out. <laughs>